Support for this episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere is made possible by MX Publishing, the largest catalog of new Sherlock Holmes books in the world. New novels, biographies, graphic novels, and short story collections about Sherlock Holmes. Find them at mxpublishing.com. Also by Dan Andriaco Mysteries, featuring Sebastian McCabe and Jeff Cody. Their new second case book called Murderer's Row is here, featuring stories around the holidays. More information at danandriaco.com. And by the Wessex Press, the premier publisher of books about Sherlock Holmes and his world. Find them online at wessexpress.com. I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, Episode 201, Remembering Jeremy Brett. I hear of Sherlock Everywhere, since you became a strong man. In a world where it's always 1895, comes I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, a podcast for devotees of Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the world's first unofficial consulting detective. I've heard of you before. Oh, Holmes the meddler, Holmes the busybody, Holmes the Scotland Yard jack in office. <laughs> the game's afoot as we discuss goings-on in the world of Sherlock Holmes enthusiasts, the bigger street irregulars, and popular culture related to the great detective. As we go to press, sensational developments have been reported. So join your hosts, Scott Monty and Burke Walder, as they talk about what's new in the world of Sherlock Holmes. You couldn't have come at a better time! Hello and welcome to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast for Sherlock Holmes devotees where it's always 1895. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Burt Walder. And Burt... I know we're here to remember Jeremy Brett, but do you remember the first time we met? <laughs> do I remember the first time we met? Uh, I think it's safe to say I I vaguely remember the first time we met. <laughs> I was not only because I remember what you were wearing, you oh. know, which was which was. Uh, you know, you were really uh, uniquely and Natalie, not not unusually, you were Natalie attired. Hmm. And I was Natalie Wood. And together we made <laughs> a wonderful production of Romeo and Juliet. I yeah. was thinking, you know, I, I was dating Natalie attire uh, back then. She was wonderful. <laughs> really now, was. you were dating Natalie and she got tired. That's what you said. <laughs> I'd get tired of me, too. Yeah. Well, uh, the show notes for this episode are available at ihose.co slash ihose201201, uh, which will take you to ihearofsherlock.com. That is our homepage, our website, where you can find all sorts of goodies and other articles if you are interested in Sherlock Holmes. We encourage you to subscribe there by email and to follow us on your favorite podcasting platform of choice. Make sure you subscribe. And if you do listen to us on Apple Podcasts, leave a rating or review there. It helps other like-minded Sherlockians find the show. And of course, you can follow us on the social networks. We are I Hear of Sherlock across all the major ones. We'd really encourage you to leave us a comment on the show notes uh, page, or if you'd just like to email us with a question or a suggestion or just chat, you can reach us at comment at IHearOfSherlock.com. David Stewart Davies is a lifelong Sherlockian. His enthusiasm for Sherlock Holmes and his creator, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, led to, well, many things, including the founding of the Northern Musgraves Sherlock Holmes Society. David is the author of 17 novels, numerous nonfiction works, and is a film historian and expert. On Sherlock Holmes. He's a member of the National Committee of the Crime Writers Association, and he has edited Red Herrings, their monthly publication since 1999. David is also a member of the Detection Club, and for 10 years edited the magazine Sherlock, which started out as the Sherlock Holmes Gazette. He's an invested member of the Baker Street Irregulars, 
and he has written numerous plays as well as short stories and novels, and he is here to join us to talk about one of the subjects of, well, more than one of his books, but certainly the subject of one very special book um, on the 25th anniversary of his passing, and that is, of course, Jeremy Brett. David Stewart Davies, welcome to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. I'm delighted to be here. Now, it's been a while since we've had you on the show. I think you were on... Yeah, I think it was... uh, We were talking about Edward Hartwick some, I don't know, four or five years ago. It was a while ago. I think it was episode 33. So for people who haven't gone that far back in our Sherlock Holmes catalog, remind us of where you first met Sherlock Holmes. The the, the character from the the, the Conan Doyle character, my my first meeting, Mm -hmm. um, was with... um, Mr. Holmes from the school library shelves when I was about 12, I think 12, 12 years old, um, and I, I found the Hound of the Baskervilles on the shelf, and uh, I've used this phrase before, but it's true. I was reading the book. I was sold into Sherlockian slavery ever since. I mean, it actually coincided with the local TV uh, station showing the Basil Rathbone films uh, also. So I, I read the book, saw the Mr. Rathbone, and Sherlock Holmes became uh, a, a passion of mine. And remains so to this day. I can't believe it, but really, that that's the way it's gone. And in, in many ways, because uh, in later life, um, early later life, as it were, <laughs> um, when I started writing about Holmes, um, and I still am, you know, uh, sort of almost 50 years after I started my first book. Wow. So, well, when did you find out that uh, there were people out there that were writing about Sherlock Holmes rather than just the Sherlock Holmes stories? Well, I think, really, uh, it was uh, Nicholas Mayer who, who sort of opened the floodgates, as it were, uh, in the in around about 1975, I think, wasn't it? Um, uh, and suddenly, uh, people were, were interested. Oh, someone's written something else about Sherlock Holmes, rather than just you know reading the Conan Doyle stories or allowing the Conan Doyle Conan Doyle stories to be the uh, uh, the, the, the fountain point of uh, the, the fountain head rather of, uh, of of your reading, and uh, and that sort of stimulated me to think, oh, perhaps I could do a bit of that too, because I'm passionate, I know the stories, I've read the character, and I'm, I'm, let me say, when I was at university in the 70s, I wanted to write my final dissertation on Conan Doyle, and at that time, I was told he was not important enough a writer to devote my time to. (laughs) I think that would be very much different now, but uh, that was the uh, the story then, and so that's what prompted me to start my first book, which was Homes of the Movies. Um, just uh, as a sort of a, uh, a side uh, entertainment to myself, really, um, because I couldn't write about him in my dissertation. What great! Well, that's revenge. always the best way, isn't it? I mean, you start something because it said something you would want to read. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it, it became uh, a, a sort of a, a wonderfully illuminating to me to, to find out because I I didn't know all that much. I knew about the Rathbone films and Peter Cushing and so forth, but delving back into way back, to, you know, to uh, William Gillette and Arthur Wanton and so forth, it was uh, an education to me as well. Hmm. Do, you, do you remember any great surprises? Your early surprises? That uh, you said to yourself, "Gee, I never knew that." I well, I, the, yeah. One of the things I think that still sticks with me is that there were over a hundred silent movies featuring Sherlock Holmes before the coming of sound, and you, you know, you have, that was to me still is quite amazing. I mean, the, some of these were from Denmark and Germany and Europe and Italy and so forth, as well as uh, the British movies. With uh, Eileen Orwood, but um, that that, that is a, the the passion for presenting Sherlock Holmes on screen before we had a talking Holmes, because in essence, Holmes only comes alive really when he's able to talk and to express his deductions and so forth. 
but the uh, you know the sort of silent movies in such a number was uh, was remarkable. Have you had a chance to see any of those silent films? Oh yes, indeed. Um, uh, we obviously the the Gillette, which was uh, just rediscovered, uh, is so interesting. And then one or two of the smaller ones. And then there was a German film I can't remember now, a German version of The Hound of the Baskervilles, which um, I had. <laughs> it sounds a bit embarrassing now. I had pleasure of introducing at a film festival in Scotland, um, uh, which was tremendously uh, atmospheric. Um, if not ha having a very chubby Holmes and a rather stupid Watson, but um, yeah. <laughs> uh, now, you know, one of the things that strikes me about your, your book, Holmes of the Movies, is you have oh, well. a, a foreword in here from none other than Peter Cushing. How did that yeah. come about? Well, that was wonderful. Um, uh, I contacted Mr. Cushing um, in the uh, well, when I'd more or less finished the manuscript, and uh, uh, he, I asked him if he would uh, would write the, the forward, um, and uh, also could I interview him, um, you know, to to put his mark on 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 his portrayal uh, of Holmes in both the Hammer film and then the TV, BBC TV series which followed. I was asked. Uh, to go and visit him at Pinewood Studios when he was filming uh, a horror movie called The Legend of the Werewolf. And uh, I, I had a, a charming time with him. Uh, we spent an hour chatting about Holmes and uh, horror films in general as well. And uh, he obviously enjoyed the, the, the time with me. I, I, I'd say this modestly. Um, because when uh, the girl, the PR girl, came to take me away from uh, interviewing him in his dressing room, he said, after lunch, come back, dear boy, we'll talk more. <laughs> and so I had my lunch in Pinewood Studios canteen <laughs> and then went back and Peter and I talked for another hour, mainly then about his wife and his grief and bereavement and so forth but he was an absolutely charming man and so then when i'd finished the manuscript i contacted him to see if he would be prepared to write an introduction and he was you know charming and said yes lovely 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 man yeah i met him again uh later when i'd written the uh, the first um my first Holmes novel, The Tangles Cane, and he signed the first 50 copies. Wow. And uh, my wife, Katie, and I went down to meet him um, in, uh, in the, well, in his secretary's house. Um, and uh, he was, you know, all that you've read about him, being a gentleman, a kind man, and uh, really charm personified. Wow, that's so wonderful to hear. And you founded a Sherlockian society in North England called the Northern Musgraves. And there's a story there about some doodles that he did that were incorporated into your uh, group's logo. Am, am I right? That's right. Uh, well, I, uh, on one occasion I wrote to him and uh, he, 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 wrote, he wrote back. And at the bottom of the page, he'd just done a little sketch of Sherlock Holmes. And uh, just for a bit of fun, really. And uh, when we formed the Northern Musgraves, the Sherlock Holmes Society of the North, as we called it, I, I wrote back to him and said, could we possibly use your sketch as our, our logo? And he said, of course, dear boy. <laughs> and then we, we used to do a, a, a publication, the Musgrave Papers, which was like a, a journal that came out uh, twice a year. And we were doing a Watson special. So I wrote to Peter and said, hmm. we're doing a, a Watson special. And is it possible for you to do a, uh, a matching sketch of Dr. Watson to, uh, to go with your Holmes sketch? And he just said, yes, of course, and <laughs> sent it back. And so we used both. Uh, and so we've got 
the original artwork of Peter Cushing. Oh, that's great. Well, we have a reproduction of those in the show notes for listeners of this episode. If you uh, just right. go to our show notes, you can check those out. Those are They seem like they're both done in, fan, uh, in fountain pen. Yeah, I think so. That's wonderful. And he was, he was a pretty talented artist, too. He was indeed. I mean, when we went went down to 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 see him at his secretary's house, some of the some of his watercolors were on the walls, and I, I said I'd love to have one of those, and he said, Oh no, they're not very good. Um, <laughs> I don't, I don't move them around. I don't sell them. I don't give them to anybody. Oh. Um, uh, he was modest uh, in that way, but they were very charming and. Uh, I, you know, I really would have loved one, but uh, it wasn't to be. Ah. Well, that's that's fantastic. So, um, talk to us a little bit about how you got on the uh, the novel writing. I mean, you you always had an interest in Holmes and the screen, and we'll get to our ultimate uh, topic here in a little bit. But talk to us a little bit about the tangled skein and how you came uh, came to write uh, novels and and more than just Sherlockian novels as well. Well, I mean, with um, with the Homes of the Movies, uh, which was my first book, which, as I say, I, I wrote sort of a, as a side issue at the university, and remarkably, uh, one of those <laughs> very strange things, uh, I sent it off to a publisher, and uh, the first publisher I tried uh, accepted it, and uh, and so it came out uh, the same year I got my degree, but the publisher. Uh, then was said, what are you going to write next? And I said, oh, I'd love to write a, a, you know, a Holmes novel. And they said, well, go ahead then, okay. And uh, uh, I wrote uh, The Tangles Gain, uh, uh, always wanting to actually do something a little bit different with, uh, with the Holmes uh, genre, rather than just reproduce um, another straightforward Conan Doyle pastiche because um, he, he'd he done it all. He, you, he, I always think you need to just inject a little originality of your own to just lift it from just being, uh, you know, a copycat um, story. Um, so I, the Tangle Thane, of course, went a, a bit perhaps over the top at the time because I was a very young man then. Um, we had Dracula, Count Dracula. Uh, in it, um, and uh, um, and it was, if you like, Conan Doyle makes Hammer films, really. Um, but anyway, it was uh, it was quite successful, and and again, Peter Cushing uh, wrote a, a, a little forward to the book, and he said in his forward, uh, if this was made into a film, I'd be very, uh, a, 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 it would be problematic of me to decide whether to play Sherlock Holmes. Or Dr. Van Helsing, which of course he played in Hammer films a few times as well. Um, so that 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 got me going onto the uh, the, the sort of Holmes uh, pastiche treadmill, if you like. Um, the second book was uh, the Hensow Affair, where I I bought the uh, brought the characters from the the uh, the Prisoner of Zender uh, and. Sherlock Holmes together. Always wanting to do a little bit, little bit something different. That's right. You know, that's what I mean. Uh, and and how many uh, Sherlock Holmes adventures have you written? Well, from a novel point of view, I've written eight novels now. But it's interesting. Just going back to the uh, the sort of start of that, I, I did encounter Dame Jean Conan Doyle on three occasions, and uh, on the first occasion it was at a, a wedding reception. And uh, remarkably, she knew who I was, and she said, "I mean, this. I remember this exchange vividly and accurately." She said, "You're a naughty boy, <laughs> taking my father's character and writing about him. You should find your own characters." And I felt wow. very humbled, and sort of a little bit, uh, sort of. Embarrassed by that, but um, I mean, she, in many ways she was quite right. Um, but I mean, in, in the intervening years from uh, from Nicholas Mayer's book, and well, I don't know how many uh, Holmes pastiches have appeared. They sort of trickle out 
<laughs> every month now, don't they? Mm. So, well, well, clearly there are thousands of them. Maybe yeah, tens absolutely. of thousands. Yeah. yeah. But that you haven't stopped there because I remember you did a book too, I think, uh, involving Oliver Twist. You know, who was yeah, assisted by was, his Clark that, trying to solve a, a, a bunch of murders? Yeah, that's right. Um, always, um, you know, sort of wanting to do something a bit different. And I got the idea of Oliver Twist as a, you know, a young man, not not the little scuffy urchin that uh, appears in the uh, in the Dickens book. But he's now become a solicitor. And uh, he's he's helping out uh, the Artful Dodger, uh, who's still a bit of a rogue, and and he takes him on as his sort of like uh, clerk, if you like, and then becomes involved in a murder mystery. I think, quite honestly, it's one of my best books because I think the uh, the plot is clever. Um, um, that, this uh, if, if this sounds pompous, I'm sorry about it, but I think the the plot is clever. But also there is a a richness of capturing my attempt to capture at least some of the atmosphere and some of the uh, the, the sort of sense of a, a Dickensian uh, milieu, if you like, hmm. oh, uh, yeah. in, in the book. And it's called uh, Oliver Twist and the Mystery of Throat Manor. So the, the throat is, I mean, it's, it's a comical title because there are obviously Dickens uh, always involved elements of comedy within even the darkest of his tales. Well, it's uh, it's a good thing you don't run into Dickens' children at weddings. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's true. Uh, all right, well, we are speaking with David Stewart. Davies will be right back after this quick word. Well, if you've been following the progress of MX Publishing, you knew it wouldn't be too long before they got to the next volumes, yes, plural, of the MX book of new Sherlock Holmes stories. We talked to David Markham here on episode 199. It included a discussion of the MX book of new Sherlock Holmes stories, volume 20. Well, guess what? David is now out with volumes 22. 23 and 24, 64 new traditional Sherlock Holmes stories. They have a Kickstarter going, and there is uh, just a little over three weeks to go on that. Uh, they have already reached more than four or five times their pledged goal of $1,200. There are 113 backers so far. Let's see if we can push those numbers a little higher, as usual. MX Publishing brings together some of the great minds in Sherlockian writing and publishing, and we have lots of stories, 64 in these three volumes, to bring you to hear and read about what Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson are up to next, set directly in the Victorian Edwardian times that we know them. Settings from 1877 to 1887, 1887 to 1894, and 1895 to 1903. Just get over to mxpublishing.com or directly on that Kickstarter link in the show notes. Show your support for this unheralded series of Sherlock Holmes stories, volumes 22 through 24 of the new Sherlock Holmes stories from MX Publishing. So, David, you talked with us a little bit about your writing career. You talked with us about Peter Cushing. Let's talk a little bit about your editing career, and specifically with Sherlock Holmes magazine, Sherlock Holmes Gazette. Well, uh, I, it started out as the Sherlock Holmes Gazette, um, and uh, it was a, a sort of a solo project by a lady called Elizabeth Wiggins. And uh, at that time, she was obviously desperate for... Uh, she wasn't Sherlock, uh, Sherlockian. She was a, just a, uh, a publisher. And I, I was able to contribute uh, some columns to it. Um, and as the magazine went on, I was doing more and more. And there's a long, complicated history with the magazine. But eventually... Um, I was offered the editorship 
of the magazine because I, I seem to be contributing most of the the, the copy anyway. Um, and that ran for uh, really just over ten years, and it had a checkered history. It was a, it was loved by fans, uh, but because it was a if you like a Cinderella publication with whoever was publishing it. Um, it never got the promotion that was needed. So in the end, it sort of, um, they had to close it down because it wasn't making any money. Mm. There is now, um, I don't know whether the American people, well, I think the American readers do, do know of the Sherlock Holmes magazine, which has just come out for the second issue, uh, which is a fantastically glossy, attractive magazine dealing with all aspects of Sherlock, from sort of films and TV uh, to obviously the acad- not academic, but interestingly sort of an analysis of the, the stories. Um, and I'm very pleased to say that I've I've got a, a regular column with that now, uh, Sherlockian scribblings, it's called, um, and uh, I, I think it will do very very well indeed. Um, Remarkably so in this age when uh, the uh, you know sort of news is on the internet all the time, and so you you don't really need to re- have a physical publication in your hand. But I think this, because it's so attractive and so detailed, that uh, it will succeed. One hopes anyway. Well, well it, it certainly reminded me of the Sherlock Holmes Gazette as it. Uh, you know, I know it It started out a little more amateurish, but became glossy uh, by the time it wrapped up. So um, it, it's nice to see that tradition being carried on. Well, yes. Uh, I mean, at one point, because of the the fact that it was seen very much, the Sherlock Mag- my Sherlock Holmes uh, Gazette magazine was seen as a very niche publication. I, I, we, we, we so sort of altered the focus of it slightly to make it the Sherlock Sherlock the detective magazine so we were able to look at other detectives within the in the pages as well so you know such as Lord Peter Whimsey and uh, in in fact Inspector Morse and and so on and so forth but um uh I think it was in the days when magazines were on their way out because you know obviously the computer age was taking over and people could just get the information and pictures they wanted from from the uh, internet. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, because it's it's now twenty five years since Jeremy Brett has uh, passed yeah. on, and it seems it seems like yesterday in some ways. Uh, it's hard to believe it's been so long. But uh, tell us what you remember about the Granada series when it first came to television. Yeah, I I, I agree with you. It. it you can't believe that it's uh, so long, so long ago. Um, my first view of the Granada series was obviously I was just a, a, a viewer, a TV viewer, and the first episode that was shown was a scandal in Bohemia. And there's a marvellous moment in it from very early on. Watson returns to Baker Street after being away for a few days, and uh, he comes in, and uh, there's homes there, but. You do not see the face of Sherlock Holmes, and Watson talks to Holmes, and we hear Holmes, but all you see is the back of his head. And then, suddenly, Holmes turns and faces Watson, and we see our new Sherlock Holmes, because bearing in mind there hadn't been a, a TV Sherlock for a good 12 years or so, and it's Jeremy Brett, and he is... Well, he's Sidney Paget brought to life, really. And the voice is so magical. Um, uh, it, it won you over straight away. It was, it was a, a chilling experience to see that. Um, now, I was lucky enough uh, to, to obviously to meet Jeremy later uh, through, the, uh, through the, the kindness of Michael Cox. Luckily, Michael Cox who was a Holmes fan, had got a copy of my book, Holmes and the Movies. And uh, so when I wrote to Michael uh, at Granada Studios saying, is there a chance of possibly interviewing Jeremy Brett? Because he'd known my book and, and realized he was a man who, you know, is not just a sort of 
gibbering fan, but someone who knows a bit about Holmes, uh, he arranged for an interview with me. And uh, that's how the whole thing of my various chats with Jeremy over the over the period um, uh, of, of the, the later series uh, took, took off. So as the series progressed, uh, David Burke um, transferred the role of Watson over to Edward Hardwick. And obviously there were different actors from episode to episode, different directors as well. What was your view of this series as it got on? Well, obviously, um, the as the series got towards the end, they did, they had actually used up um, the the better stories in the early series, and uh, they were struggling a bit with the uh, the later series. I mean, I think the uh, the three Garadevs, for example, um, had to squeeze in another plot line and so forth. And of course, um, as the the series progressed, Jeremy had. Uh, problems with his health. He got a weak heart, and he got um, the uh, sort of mental illness that uh, uh, was was very dogging to him. Um, I, I I met David Burke, but not during the time he was filming with with Brett. Um, my time when I first met uh, Jeremy was during the filming of The Hand of the Baskervilles, when. Edward Hardwick was in place. Um, uh, Edward Hardwick, another absolutely charming gentleman, as you as you know. Mm. Um, and uh, uh, Jeremy threw himself so much into the playing of the part. He he was um, in the old theatrical uh, phrase. He was a becomer. Um, that means that he uh, he actually inherited the part. Uh, when he was playing it, um, and that sort of exacerbated some of his ill health because he you know, he he was himself a very outgoing, jolly, hail well hail and hearty man, um, and then he had to so, sort of draw all that away to inherit this misogynistic, dark, um, and uh, sort of desperate intellectual character in the sense that, you know, the brain was everything and so forth. Um, and and I, I think it unbalanced him uh, quite a lot towards the end of, of his role. He once said in an interview that he wouldn't cross the street to meet Holmes. And then he corrected himself and he said, no, Holmes wouldn't cross the street to meet me. <laughs> to meet me. Yeah. I think also Basil Rathbun said something of a similar nat- similar a similar thing. Um, uh, it is interesting uh, that Sherlock Holmes has so many fans, and yet he has so many bad attitudes to life. Really, um, it, it, it's it's a, 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 a paradox, really, that um, he appeals to uh, so many people, and yet um, he is harsh to Watson, he's misogynistic, he's difficult to live with, and so forth and so on. But I do think also um, that Jeremy, because of his charismatic character, um, was able to actually make Holmes, despite all his failings, an attractive character. And I know, obviously, at the time uh, the series were going out, um, a lot of women wanted to be Mrs. Hudson, wanted to be Irene Adler, so to, to, to be close to him. And uh, obviously, partly due to the fact that Jeremy was a very, very attractive man. Mm. What do you, have you thought a little bit about the, the appeal of Jeremy Brett? You know, on the one hand, you have a similar phenomenon with Benedict Cumberbatch in that his home's has become profoundly attractive to people around the world. But I wonder if it's because of Jeremy's ability to disappear into the character that that even today, you know, we remember him so fondly. And indeed, there's still an enormous amount of activity and interest around the Granada series. There is, I think, partly because he, um, he was, hey, as I said earlier, he was a very attractive man anyway. But also, um, the, he was able to in, inject uh, a kind of 
impishness into some of his uh, uh, some of his scenes. His the little little laugh they would have, or the raise of the eyebrow, or that that you know sudden movements. I mean, there, there is uh, in one of the early episodes where he jumps over this sofa to to answer the door. That kind of uh, impishness and boyishness that sometimes broke through the the, the harsh. Uh, face of uh, the you know the serious detective um, was very appealing. I, I think he made him a very a very interesting character for people to watch. And yes, women liked him, but a lot of men did too. I mean, I did too. You know, not in a uh, in any kind of romantic sexual way, but you just think, oh, I wish I could be like that. And I think that's part of the appeal of Sherlock Holmes in general, really. Uh, we all wish we could be as bright as Holmes, and if not, we'd like to be Watson so we could share our lives with him. Mm. You know, in your book about Jeremy Brett as Sherlock Holmes, called Bending the Willow, in the last chapter, and it is indeed the last chapter of his life, uh, you you nod to what you were just referring to as that impishness there, and you write, you wrote, I did not want to end this book with the death of Jeremy Brett. It would be too depressing a finale for a man who had such a fierce passion and a verve for life, a man who so enjoyed laughing and creating laughter. Are there any anecdotes or incidents that stand out to you that you can tell us about? Uh, No, I I can't personally, but I, I do know that, for example... Um, he would have a, a, a Polaroid camera, if that means anything to anybody nowadays. <laughs> a a, a cam, camera that takes pictures and immediately produces a little print from them. And he would go around the set uh, during the filming and take pictures of uh, the people on the set. Now, not just the sort of famous actors who were guest starring or anything but also the technicians the makeup girl the tea lady and so forth and at the end of the week he would erect a board and put all these pictures on for them to see mm. as, a, as a, a, a you know a bit of fun and that that to me in, a, in many ways sums up his sort of kindness and generosity and and joie de vivre uh, that he had uh, in his own personality uh, that um, uh, that, that uh, you know was was uh, there within the man in addition to his humor he was very protective of conan doyle's original writing and of the concept of the character from the pages can you talk a little bit about how he fought for um shall we say the true sherlock to come through on the screen yeah i can give you two two examples of that actually um i i can't remember the story now but um uh in one story um he didn't like the um uh, the way that a, a particular scene was going and he said Holmes says more in in Conan Doyle's story uh, than the scriptwriter has given me here I would like to put back the words of Doyle yeah. and the director said well we're a bit short of time he said look I'll learn them over lunchtime and we'll do him <laughs> we'll do them this afternoon and by Jove he did um, and because he was so keen that Doyle was was being represented in this new TV version, um, <laughs> there's a, a, a slightly painful uh, episode for me personally, because when they started doing the two-hour episodes, and they, they were prompted by that to some extent by the Inspector Morse series and the most um to our episodes which have become very popular in Britain. And and the most episodes was was revolutionary because usually you know, a TV show was either in episodes of an hour or uh, complete in an hour, as the Sherlock Holmes uh, episodes were. But now it was an evening's viewing really, two hours of television with one story. 
And so Granada was thought they would do that. But they were running out of things because um, the, the, uh, the short stories of Conan Doyle don't really lend themselves to a two-hour uh, uh, program. And Joe Wyndham Davis had uh, been in touch with me about something. And I said, well, I've got, I'm halfway through a novel. Um, uh, it was the uh, uh, Scroll of the Dead, which um, was involving mummies. And in my uh, synopsis of the novel, as I was working on it, Holmes and Watson go to Egypt. Well, she she asked me to read, uh, she asked me to send her the uh, what I'd written so far, which is about half the novel, and liked it very much, and said, we'll do this, but we can't go to Egypt. We can't afford um, sets or, or even flying out Jeremy and Edward to Egypt. So c- could you possibly rework it so that it, it stays in England? Which I did. I mean, I worked furiously over about four or five days and sent it, sent the sort of a, 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 an abbreviated element of the end of the novel to her and she liked it and said we'll do it and Jeremy Paul agreed to write the script so my god you can imagine how I felt at this time <laughs> good lord are we going to do one of my stories with Jeremy Brett how wonderful that would be and then Jeremy said no Nothing to do with the story at all, but I'm not doing anything that isn't Doyle. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was dropped immediately. Uh, I, I finished the novel, and the novel uh, uh, is, is still available for purchase, <laughs> The Scroll of the Dead, with um, the climax taking place in the Lake District in, in, in Britain rather than in Egypt. <laughs> but um, uh, So I came close, but not... Uh, no cigar, as they say. Must have been Jeremy and Dame Jean conspiring behind the scenes there. <laughs> Sounds like a great story. The first Sherlock Holmes parody was probably written in 1896, The Field Bazaar, by Arthur Conan Doyle himself. He knew laughing was good for you. That's why the Wessex Press continues the tradition with The True Adventures of Sherlock Holmes by Terence Faherty. It's a rare collection of Watson's early first drafts of the cases of Sherlock Holmes that will show you the truth behind the engineer's thumb and the strange insanity of General Waxbutton. Learn the actual facts behind the adventure of the notorious parasol chaser and astonish your friends when you tell them The man with the twisted lip actually struck it big as a part-time bustle fitter. Seven of these great stories have been published in Ellery Queen's Mystery Magazine, and four appear here for the very first time in this very first collection. Now is the perfect time for a comfortable chair and a long laugh. Get the true adventures of Sherlock Holmes at wessexpress.com today. David, the title of the book, Bending the Willow, where does that phrase come from? Well, it's something that Jeremy said to me, talking about playing Sherlock Holmes. He said, um, you know, I'm playing Sherlock Holmes as he's presented in the books, but I am actually bending the willow. In other words, he was just taking it a little bit beyond the accepted presentation, if you like. I think it's a fantastic phrase because the, the willow tree is something that will actually bend but always keep in shape. That's a wonderful analogy. Well, we will be right back with more of David Stewart Davies right after this word. David, what do you see? Um, what did you? What do you think Jeremy meant when he said? Bending. What aspects of Holmes do you think he felt he was stressing or shaping in particular? Well, I think possibly some of the humor that he uh, uh, indulges in um, and uh, the laughter and uh, that he injects in some of the scenes. Um, um, and that's all I can think of. He, 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 he's, he's more theatrical than Doyle's. Holmes, I think, really, and that's part of 
uh, Jeremy's own natural theatrical character anyway. He was a, a very outre person, lots of arm throwing about and eyes flashing and and uh, extreme sort of generosity too. Now you updated your work on Sherlock Holmes on the screen in 2001 and then updated that again in 2007 in a book called Starring Sherlock Holmes. Can you tell us a little bit about that book and about the impressive character whom you got to write the foreword? Oh, the foreword was by Ian Richardson, yeah. Um, well, the uh, uh, it was Titan, the publishers, who I still work with. Um, uh, they, But they imposed upon me... Um, the format. Um, I wanted to, because I said, well, look, some films uh, require a lot more discussion than other films, um, but I had a sort of set number of words for films. I had to do the sort of a, a like a synopsis at the top of the page and then discuss the films. And I said, I want to say more about this. But no, you don't, you don't have any more words. So it was a very um, sort of corseted <laughs> writing process. process. But um, nevertheless, I enjoyed doing it. And I, and I worked with some very nice guys at time doing that. Uh, in fact, when the book came out, they, they actually um, presented me uh, with a, a rare um, Holmes poster, which I thought was very sweet of them. Um, uh, and uh, obviously, uh, Ian Richardson, I thought, um, was a quite a, a very, very uh, decent Holmes as well. And I met him um, when he was doing the murder rooms. And uh, he was absolutely another charming man. It is interesting. I've, I've met quite a few Sherlock's, as you can imagine. <laughs> and the really good ones, and I'm thinking about Douglas Wilmer, Peter Cushing, and uh, obviously Jeremy, um, they researched the character before they went uh, onto the uh, film set. Uh, they knew what Doyle had written about them. And in fact, um, the Granada series had a booklet uh, with all characteristics about Holmes that was presented to the uh, screenwriters uh, to uh, make sure that they were keeping in, in touch with the original. And Ian Richardson made his own book up of, you know, he smokes this, he does that, he has a, a tobacco in his Persian slipper and so forth, um, because he was so keen to get that right. Um, and I, it was a pity that he never actually made more films. Mm. Um, he just made the two. But uh, he was a charming guy. And uh, who who else could I get to write an introduction <laughs> but him at that time? Because yeah. obviously Jeremy had gone and, uh, and Peter was, you know, sort of uh, not well and so forth. Yeah. Your interest and activity go beyond the printed page. Um, and 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 go beyond the screen as well. You've actually written a few plays. In particular, I'm thinking about the 1999 play Sherlock Holmes: The Last Act, which was a role that was inhabited almost exclusively, if not exclusively, by an actor by the name of Roger Llewellyn. How did he come to inhabit that role, and how did you decide to write a play? Absolutely, yes. I mean, it was interesting about Roger, because um, it was when I was editing the Sherlock magazine, and so I used to go and see any Sherlock Holmes production to, to review it for and talk about it for, for the magazine. And he was uh, appearing in The Hand of the Baskervilles, uh, in, a, in a sort of small theatre in the Midlands. And I went down to see him in doing this play. And I thought he was very good as Sherlock Holmes. And uh, I interviewed him after the production that I saw, after the evening's performance. And I said, you really ought to play Sherlock Holmes again. And he said to me, what I would really like to do is a one-man show with Sherlock Holmes. 
And I said, oh, a one-man show, Sherlock Holmes. I don't think that's possible. And driving home, because it was a long journey home, I just had this idea in the car how it could be done. And uh, I wrote the first act uh, and sent it to Roger because I, I, you know, I made a contact with him at the theatre. And he rang me and said, "This is brilliant. This is wonderful. Oh, get do, do the second act and let me have it as soon as possible." Well, I, I wrote the second act as soon as I could possibly, and uh, and then I got another phone call said saying, "This is terrible." <laughs> <laughs> Uh, he said, "He said it's just like the first act." He said, <laughs> he said, "You, you can't do that. You've got to have a surprise in the second act that uh, you surprises the audience and, and and you know engages their interest. They don't want to see a, you know a progression of what what really has been been going on in the uh, in the first act." And uh, that prompted me to think, oh, "What the hell do I do?" and it sounds very romantic now, but we, but my wife and I were, were on the verge of going to uh, Paris for a, a long weekend, and I took a notebook with me and sat in in uh, pavement cafes, uh, uh, jotting down things. And I came back with it with the idea that uh, uh, that takes up the second act of uh, the last act, and uh, and Roger said, "Wow, this is good," and that's how it all. Yeah, took off then. But my oh, what, my, you, my last you... play, sorry, my last play, which which was premiered um, in Edinburgh uh, last February, a, a year last February. Um, I th- I think is my best work, but unfortunately, um, because of uh, now COVID and so forth, and also getting a play off the ground is very very difficult these days um whether it'll ever be seen again is another matter what, what play was that this is called Sherlock Holmes the final reckoning uh, and the man who uh, the man who played Sherlock it's it's a two-hander this time it's a Holmes and Watson um and the man who played Sherlock Holmes uh, an actor called Michael Daviot it was Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. A tall, thin man. I met him a couple of years at, prior to that, uh, when I was up at the Edinburgh Fringe doing a, a Sherlock thing, and uh, he came to see me, and then I went to see he. He, he had a one-man show about um, uh, Max Schreck, uh, not to Caligari man, and uh, uh, it. Uh, Oh, no, Dr. Caligari, uh, Nosferatu man. And, uh, he, uh, he, he, he said, I, I'd love to play Sherlock Holmes. And I said, well, you look like Sherlock. He does. He, uh, he's got the aquiline features. He's a Rathburnish, uh, and thin and so forth. And he was absolutely brilliant, um, in, uh, in this, uh, production of, of my play in Edinburgh, but um, nothing has happened with it since, unfortunately. So, if there's anybody out there who wants to be an angel and uh, produce a, a Sherlock Holmes drama, when the world returns to normal, that sounds like a tempting offer. So, David, what's next for you? What 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 latest project is on your plate, and what are you planning for? Well. Um, it's interesting because I've I've done other things. Uh, um, obviously, as you mentioned, the Oliver Twist book. Um, my character Johnny Hawk, stroke Johnny One Eye. I wrote six novels uh, featuring him. He was a private detective during the Second World War, and this year I I, I updated him. Well, not updated him, but I I brought him into the uh, in the fifties, the Cold War area, um, in a book called The Spiral. Of lies, um, but from the Holmes point of view, I'm uh, I've, I've uh, just had a, having a, um, a a story in in a, in a collection called the Book of Extraordinary Sherlock Holmes Stories, which is going to be out in America um, by Christmas, and there's a short story in there of mine called Sherlock Holmes and the Terrified Tobacconist. Um, and I've also been commissioned to write 
a short story for another collection with Titan next year. On the novel front, um, I'm just tightening up uh, the synopsis for a, f- a full-length novel called Sherlock Holmes, The, Re- the Revenge from the Grave for Titan. Um, so hopefully that will be out probably towards the end of next year. My latest um, published Holmes novel, um, it, it, you might, your listeners might be interested in this. It's called <clears throat> Sherlock Holmes, The Instrument of Death. Uh, um, but as I said earlier, that I always wanted to inject something a bit different into the Holmes stories. And this involves Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Caligari. Now, uh, it's Dr. Caligari before um, the cabinet of Dr. Caligari time. He's, he's in England before he goes off uh, to uh, to Europe and uh, has the uh, the murders with Cesare. And when I wrote the book um, for Titan, I said I called it Sherlock Holmes and the Caligari Murders. And they said, "Who's Caligari?" No one will know who Caligari is. You've got to find a different title. That's just confusing to people. I couldn't believe that. Surely the intelligent reader of today knows. That, well, perhaps they don't. I don't know. So anyway, it became Sherlock Holmes and the Instrument of Death, which I suppose is not a bad title, but it, it was very surprising that they, they rejected the Caligari murders. <laughs> Well, we're grateful to have them and so much of what you do. David Stewart Davies, it's been a pleasure speaking with you today. Uh, Come back again sometime. uh, uh, It's lovely to to speak to you, Scott. And and the the strange thing is, uh, if we go back to our early, the very beginning of our conversation, when I said I met Sherlock Holmes on the library shelves Mm. when I was about 12, and he has actually been with me all those years now. I mean, I sometimes say I'm, I must write something new. Must write, and then, as I said earlier, um, I've, I've already got a commission for another Sherlock Holmes story. I'm working on another Sherlock Holmes novel. He's just there. I've, I'm now a regular columnist in the Sherlock Holmes magazine. Um, so he is just... Um, the third person in my life, really, <laughs> um, along with my darling wife Katie. That's great. Um, so, uh, and I, 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 I don't. I'm not that kind of doll. I don't um, re- re- resent it at all. No, it sounds like it's been a, a great gift. The gift that keeps on giving. Indeed, indeed, yeah, yeah. Excellent. And it's lovely to talk to you. And I, I, I would like to send all my warm wishes to. Uh, my American Sherlockian friends and, and readers, because uh, we're in a, 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 a bit of a pickle at the moment worldwide, and uh, and at least we we've, we've got Sherlock to look back on on and help us out. Perfectly stated. It's wonderful to talk to David any time, but particularly now when we're marking a celebration, a milestone around Jeremy Brett. Um, I love what he had to say. You know, we 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 all wish we could be as bright as Holmes, and, and Jeremy made that very visible on the screen. But you know, I was really interested in his his remark about what he thought some of the underlying appeal of Jeremy's performance was and why he became so charismatic and magnetic to people and david said the the humor and the impishness and i love that example that he gave of jeremy jumping over the couch and his description of brett when he wasn't in characters being sort of a hail fellow well met which is the last thing you would have thought (laughs) that this poor troubled sherlock holmes um would have been and uh Uh, It's just a lovely conversation, and it's just great to revisit David's work and talk about what's coming up for him. Yeah, yeah, and, you know, David himself uh, has a wonderful sense of humor, and we've seen that 
uh, showing itself time and again, and particularly where he is performing, um, you know, e- either in uh, song or rhyme or uh, even even gestures. Uh, it's been hysterical at some of the uh, events, and you know, it, it makes sense that. A, a man like that with a sense of humor would recognize a great sense of humor in someone like Jeremy Brett. And, and I think there, there are elements that, that we see that come through. Just Holmes's laugh. You know, what, what other f- productions can we think of where Holmes is actually credited with laughing? Um, to me, this was the first Holmes that was humanized in that way, a little softer on that side. And I want to read one segment from the final chapter of Bending the Willow that illustrates Jeremy Brett's sense of humor. Uh, David Burke um, mentioned this at the Northern Musgraves Memorial Lunch uh, for Jeremy Brett. Um, David writes that it's a tale that reveals not only Brett's humor and eccentricity, but also his endearing, self-effacing qualities. And this is David telling the story now. Uh, Jeremy said to me on one occasion, I was feeling so low the other day that I sent myself a fan letter. Are you serious? I'm absolutely serious. What did you write to yourself? Dear Jeremy, I would just like to say what a wonderful actor you are. Your Sherlock Holmes puts every other attempt in the pod to shade. Basil Rathbone is not fit to clean your boots, and Douglas Wilmer and Robert Stevens should beg you to give them lessons. You're much prettier than all of them, for a start. There's only one word for your performance. Magic. Please (laughs) send me a signed photograph. Yours, Joe Bloggs. P.S. I've just heard that you're a really nice person, too. Did you really write that? Yes, I did, David. Did you send it? Yes, I put a first-class stamp on it. I wanted to get it as soon as possible. It came the next morning. And, <laughs> and, and did you read it? Oh, of course I read it. I read it a dozen times. I felt wonderful afterwards. Well, did you send yourself a signed photograph? David, I may be mad, but I'm not barking mad. In any case, the bugger didn't send a stamped self-addressed envelope. <laughs> Oh, that's a lovely story. I like that. It really is. It really is. And it's a wonderful book. Um, very few available now, but it was published by Calabas, Calabash Press in 1996. So it would have been the year after uh, Brett left us. <laughs> Well, that is a wonderful sound that goes along with that wonderful book, and that means it is time for everyone's favorite Sherlockian quiz show. That's right, it's Canonical Couplets, where we give you two lines of poetry, and you have to guess which story we're referring to. The last time around, we gave you this clue. An ugly long hair, fond of creosote, led to the Thames, and a steam-powered boat. Bert, do you know the answer to that canonical couplet? Oh, yes, of course I do. That is a terrific story. It's about the discovery of the lost recipe for a spicy old English condiment. That's the mustard victual. (laughs) You know, I keep wondering if you're going to run out of these. Um, (laughs) And you do not disappoint. No, no, that's incorrect. And uh, let me say that Eric Decker sent in a guess as well. Uh, He said the correct answer is the story about the quartet of Oompa Loompas who struggle to advertise their brothel in Victorian England, the sign of the four orange pimps. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Oh, I wish I'd thought of that. That's great. Yeah, it is. It is fantastic. He was so close, too. It is. It's the, the sign of four. That's it. Very the good. sign of four. Well, we're going to go ahead and spin the big prize wheel and see what we come up with. And it's going around and around and slowing down, landing on number 38. And that corresponds to Douglas Vaughn. <laughs> Douglas, congratulations. We'll be sending you a copy of Enola Holmes, The Case of the Missing Marquess. And 
now it's time for this episode's canonical couplet, which goes as follows. Half a crown for breakfast and eight shillings for a bed. Just the sort of lodging for a man back from the dead. If you know the answer to this episode's canonical couplet, jot it down in an email addressed to comment that I hear of Sherlock.com with canonical couplet in the title. If you are among all of the correct responses and we choose your name at random, you will win. Good luck. And if you're the lucky winner, you will get to pick the David Stewart Davies book of your choice that is still in print from his website. Take a look and let us know. Well, you heard us in the last episode talking about Dan Andriaco Mysteries. There's so much to enjoy from Dan. The latest, of course, is Murderer's Row, which came out on Kickstarter. Uh, we've got some great news. Um, probably by the time most of you hear this, uh, the Kickstarter will have been funded. Uh, there, As we are recording it, there are uh, just about 24 hours left to go. It ends on September 30th. Uh, the good news is, with this, like many MX Kickstarter projects, even though uh, you may not have gotten in on the backer or supporter level, you will still have an opportunity to get the book because MX Publishing does all of its books on demand. Now, uh, Bert, there are more Dan Andriaco mysteries available other than just Murderer's Row, if I'm recalling correctly. Yes, there have been a series of them with titles like uh, No Police Like Holmes, Holmes Sweet Holmes, The 1895 Murder, The Disappearance of Mr. James Fillimore, one of our favorite subjects, as well as uh, The Adventure of the Vatican Cameos, which is a short story. So there's uh, a lot to choose from here. And the lovely thing is that there was a $500 goal for the Kickstarter and at the time we're recording this, they've already achieved seven hundred and forty nine dollars. So is, it's not every it's not every day you exceed your goal by fifty percent. I know. That's fantastic. And it's just a testament to how people love the characters of uh McCabe and Cody. They are like a modern day Holmes and Watson, lots of touches throughout there in uh modern day uh uh Aaron. I, I think I remember uh, Aaron Go Bloody was one of the uh, novels we've talked about in the past. So uh, check out Dan Andriaco Mysteries at danandriaco.com and at MX Publishing. Excellent. Yeah, we've done it again. And what a good conversation. It's so great to hear, David, and so uh, so irritating that with all of this uh, – lockdown and restrictions that we can't get together face to face, but it gives us a lot to look forward to. It does. It does. And, and both David and Katie are uh, wonderful members of the BSI and, and wonderful human beings to be around. So we'll look forward to that once again. And hopefully you can find your friends, your Sherlockian counterparts at meetings close to you at some point. In the meantime, I'm sure there are lots of places that are meeting on Zoom and other online connections. And the good news there is you can connect with people all around the world by virtue of a camera and feel like you're still part of this Sherlockian community. So let us know if you'd like help locating any of those. We do see them flying across our screen from time to time. We're going to probably start promoting some of them on Facebook and Twitter and wherever we can. And uh, we will point you in that direction. Well, in the meantime, this is the North by Northwest, Scott Monty. <laughs> and I am the so under Burt Wolder. <laughs> and together we say the, the games, games of foot. foot. <laughs> <laughs> the, the games, games of foot. <laughs> I'm afraid that in the pleasure of this conversation, I am neglecting business of importance, which awaits me elsewhere. Thank you for listening. Please be sure to join us again for the next episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast dedicated to Sherlock Holmes. Goodbye, and good luck, and believe me to be my dear fellow. 
Very sincerely yours, Sherlock Holmes. 